In the last 25 years, no state added more people or jobs than Texas. Continued growth in Texas depends on an ample supply of key infrastructure, things like power, telecommunications, electricity, and water. Texas's continued growth will depend on ongoing investments in all of these assets. The Texas Real Estate Research Center is making a bigger commitment to cover these assets and to talk about why they're important for Texas real estate. For the first time in the 48-year history of our Tierra Grande Journal, every article will address the supply and demand for water in Texas. I'm Daniel Oney. I'm the research director at the center, and I'm joined today by three of the authors of articles in this special issue, Lynn Krebs, George Barrow, and Harold Hunt. We're going to have a conversation today about what they've learned and why it's important for our stakeholders. So welcome, gentlemen. Water is an emotional topic because our lives and livelihoods really depend on it. Um, some people may think that, uh, that no one's doing anything. Uh, Texas actually has a water planning process, and out of necessity and foresight, the state has been doing this for a long time. So Lynn, you and Charles Gilliland actually did a great job looking at the history of water planning in Texas. Um, what would you want our readers to know about the, the things that you discovered? I think the first thing I'd want to explain is that uh, we're not caught flat-footed. The, the state has been aware of needs for water planning for a long time. Actually, the most severe drought in our history it was in 1917, and uh, the Constitution was amended at that point to address that and uh, created things like river authorities and, and so on. Um, and then, you know, we've had other periods of time, such as in the 1950s, uh, which is what we consider the record of drought, actually, 1950 to 1957 where we developed a lot of the infrastructure in our water plan. So it's a comprehensive water plan. And one of the things I think is important to know is that um, it's regionally based and uh, each region uh, has a water planning board that invites public participation. They announce public hearings um, and, and encourage, and I encourage people um, th to get involved in that, particularly if you have, you know, critical infrastructure needs, maybe you're in farming or ranching or in some other field or you're part of city planning, et cetera, obviously uh, there's opportunities to get involved there. So that that's critical. Also, there are groundwater conservation districts, but there are not, uh, not every county in Texas is covered by a groundwater conservation district. So that's still something that's evolving and something to pay attention to. And if you're in a county that doesn't have one, you should, uh, I would encourage you to look, look into um, how it works in other parts, maybe nearby, uh, nearby counties and regions um, and, and, and consider uh, getting involved in, in starting one in your area. Okay, Lynn, thanks for that. So from my own research, I learned that water use varies dramatically from city to city in Texas. But when you uh, look at the details, uh, it's agriculture, energy, uh, and manufacturing that explains why some cities use a lot more water than average. When you focus on just our homes, schools, shops, um, then the difference isn't so great. So George, you and Yenling Mayor looked at something that's called municipal water use. Uh, and tell us what that is and, and what did you find out about that category of water use? Yeah, so uh, municipal water demand is uh, largely water that's supplied by cities um, and it comprises most of the water uh, that's demanded by households and businesses, um, really, if you think about a lot of uh, commercial real estate and, and commercial properties, uh, they're comprising the, the largest categories uh, within the municipal water category. So municipal water currently comprises roughly one third of the state demand. And this is one of the categories that scales up with population growth and economic growth. And so, uh, you know, we've had exceptionally high uh, population and economic growth in the state of Texas over the last several decades, and that's projected to continue increasing into the future. And so uh, that figure of one third of state demand is projected to increase to about 44 percent. So a lot of the water issues, a lot of the uh, policies aimed at resolving water has to do with, uh, you know, creating the capacity uh, to grow and, and grow in, in a way that uh, addresses the needs of all the stakeholders. 
So one of the interesting things that we found was that uh, there have been massive efficiency gains over the last several decades. So starting from the 1970s, when uh, we had kind of the introduction of water meters, uh, before water meters that had just been a flat fee assessed to households, um, that was something that really began to uh, restrict uh, water use uh, uh, as, as it corresponded to uh, households and other uh, stakeholders and other users. Then there was uh, federal legislation in the 1990s that uh, restricted flow rates on things like toilets and shower heads. And then just a lot of conservation efforts and education uh, contributed to significant efficiency gains. And because of that, there was a reduction of uh, water use per capita of about 20% here in the state of Texas over the past two decades. So it really highlights the role that efficiency can play in water demand and resolving water issues. And uh, the hope is certainly that that can continue to trend in a positive direction as Texas continues to grow in the years to come. Right. So it's a, it's a matter of uh, the growth could potentially overwhelm gains in efficiency if you don't keep keep improving. That's right. Okay. So most of uh, Texas's water comes from relatively fresh uh, groundwater well sources or from rivers and lakes, uh, but there are uh, so-called alternative sources of water supply. Harold, uh, in your article, you looked at what Texas cities are doing in some of these alternative areas. So what are, what are localities up to in, in trying to address their water needs beyond the, the basics that, that I just mentioned? Well, I guess first I'm piggyback on what George said as far as conservation. That That's really the low-hanging fruit, and it's really important. And we saw that in El Paso, where uh, compared to the 1980s, they're using 40% less water per capita today than they were back then. So conservation is a big one. But then on the alternative side, uh, you've got things like brackish water. And we've got billions of gallons of, of brackish water here in Texas that aren't being utilized because currently desal costs are, are higher than what the public is willing to pay. But uh, the technology is improving. Uh, I think brackish water will be a really big factor in the future as well. And then on the, the wastewater recycling side, I mean, that's sort of an educational thing. Uh, you've got to convince people that uh, you can actually recycle wastewater and uh, the city of Big Spring has actually pulled that off. So that's a success story there. So one of the things that was actually one of those myths that I think uh, was dispelled for me was when we think about desalinization, I usually think about seawater. But you just mentioned we, we're already desalinating water in Texas, but it's not from the ocean, correct? Correct. And that's a whole lot cheaper because to uh, do desal from, say, the Gulf, is much more expensive than brackish water, which is uh, has much less salt. So yeah, it's it's uh, much less energy used, much cheaper water to uh, desal brackish water. So I've I've never seen a study that didn't raise more questions, more issues. So um, we've talked a little bit about some of the things that we learned in this special effort here, but we couldn't squeeze everything into uh, into one journal. Uh, so. So what are you all, what are you thinking about? What was, what was on your mind as this journal was going to press? You know, Lynn, you looked at almost 100 years of history in, in water planning, but we're, this is an ongoing process. What do we need to be thinking about going forward? Well, yeah, it's, it's really going to be where we allocate our resources. You know, for example, the funding that, um, record amounts of funding that was dedicated in this most recent legislative session that just concluded earlier this year, um, is really split almost half and half between conservation and efficiency, as well as practical things like additional reservoirs, additional wells, and that sort of thing. Um, but even though we did dedicate more money than ever, um, there are estimates out there that show that what we've dedicated is uh, just really dwarfed by um, the the future needs. Um, so it's a great it's a great additional investment, but um, it's not fixed. You know, it's definitely an improvement to the plan and to the funding, but um, there will, this will continue to be a, a top issue for the state for years to come. But it is, it is solvable. It is, it is manageable, uh, even with the expected growth we have. Um, you know, and, and Texas, um, I'm happy to say, you know, through my research, um, I've heard other sources say this, and I'm more convinced of this now, that 
Uh, not only do we have a comprehensive water plan as a state, but it's regionally focused, and I think that's wise. But it's actually uh, considered the leading, or at least one of the leading role models for water planning in the nation. You know, that's a great point. And one thing that I would add to that, you know, piggyback Lynn, is that we've got a whole journal full of research, and that research really couldn't have been completed if it were not for the data that the state of Texas had been developing for decades. So, uh, and I, looking at, at what other states had available, we're, we have a, a rich source of data to, to study, and that data was mandated by the legislature to do this kind of water planning. So we're just benefiting from that, that, uh, that policy decision. So, I mean, George, you, you talked about uh, municipal water use as the state grows over the next few couple of generations, we're gonna see municipal use overtake irrigation, crop use for agriculture. I mean, what are you what are you thinking about? Uh, what's the next issues for for that that topic? Yeah, so so one particular uh, policy that was maybe not intended to address water issues might actually uh, help contribute to a part of the solution as we move forward as a state, and that is uh, Senate Bill fifteen, um, which was actually a piece of legislation that reduced the minimum lot size that municipalities could. Uh, enforce, and by doing that, allowed for smaller lot sizes. So uh, that was really targeted at maybe the housing affordability issue to to allow for more dense uh, residential developments. But as it turns out, this is actually something that may contribute to uh, you know a- allocating uh, the 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 water resources as we move forward as a state and deal with population and and economic growth. And and that's because as you get denser residential uh, developments, you get more efficient water use. And so uh, if you think about it, smaller lots mean uh, less to water, less of a lawn to maintain. And as a result, uh, that piece of legislation may have unexpectedly uh, been something that contributes to uh, solving some of the water issues. So as we move forward, that's something that we'll be paying attention to. Uh, We're interested to see how uh, improved density or increased density can uh, reduce the burden on our water resources. Yeah, that's definitely something to track. So yeah, thanks for that insight. Well, Harold, we've got um, cities and and towns all over Texas that are are addressing water. You've looked at some of these big case studies. I mean, what what are you thinking is the, some of the next steps or what would you, what would you want to look at next if you were picking up a new project? I think there's got to be some real thought about educating the public, the widespread public, because when I spoke to the water uh, utility people in El Paso, they immediately said, you know, back in the 80s, people just assumed that when you turned on the faucet, the water would come out, and they weren't aware of the problem. And so they were really kind of resistant to conservation and all those things. But when we educated them, about what the problem was, and we might have a shortage, then they really changed their mindset, and now they say it's a way of life. So I think just coming up with a plan to educate everyone about, okay, here's the issue, here's the problem, so that everybody's on the same page will really be important. Now that makes sense. Well, there's still a lot to do. Uh, Well, gentlemen, thank you for, uh, I think that the contributions that you've made and the rest of the team made to creating this um, special issue of Tierra Grande. We're calling it Wrangling Texas Water. Uh, I think it may be one of the most impactful issues that the, the center has ever put out. So thank you for taking some time to learn a little bit about what we've been doing. And for all the details, please visit our website.